Hey, everybody. We are coming at you live from Rowe Galleries, and welcome to this week's installment of the Friday Lecture Series. And we're really happy to be joined by current exhibiting artist in Upper Row, Nat Lancaster, who is a Charlotte-based artist and also a fellow UNCC alum. So uh, we'll start out with a little tour of the exhibition and then we'll sit down. And I know that a lot of you all submitted some great questions for Nat. So we wanna to get to as many of those as we can. So we'll do a quick tour and then we'll sit down and we'll look at some questions and uh, just have a, a general conversation. So we're, we'll start with just kind of a, an introduction of, of who you are as an artist and then we'll start going around to some pieces. Okay, sure. Well, I'm Nathaniel Lancaster. Uh, I am a graduate, uh, 2009, uh, UNC Charlotte, uh, BFA in uh, painting. Uh, kind of was here in the late 90s to 2000 and then took a little break and came back uh, and finished uh, my undergrad 2008, 2009. I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for having me back, Adam, and, uh, and then your arts for supporting me through everything. Um, so I guess we'll start with some of the older work and move through uh, what I kind of, uh, the newest stuff. Um, this piece is called, Are You Shooting Yourself in the Face? And Are You Shooting Yourself in the Foot or Punching Yourself in the Face? Um, it was kind of exploring, um, this idea of erasure within a piece, uh, erasing information, but also adding information um, through the text. And that duality is really, really interesting to me uh, while erasing the visual information, but um, it's a little more confusing. Uh, it was also, interesting to me to kind of have a sense of levity in some of my work, um, maybe having a serious tone, but also kind of a tongue in cheek, uh, kind of, um, prospect or, or look at some of the work. Um, so all this was achieved through, uh, masking off, uh, the text and then painting over and then going back and taking all the masking off. Uh, this piece was actually painted in my, uh, one of the last painting projects uh, classes here at UNCC uh, before I graduated. Um, so I've learned explain? a lot from making this piece. <laughs> yeah. Did you already explain the subject? Sorry. Uh, I hadn't really, it was, so uh, these pictures were actually taken uh, when I lived in, uh, I moved out to Los Angeles uh, in between my stints here uh, at UNCC. Um, and these were two of my roommates at the time. They're uh, film guys. Uh, and we spent some time one day just taking really silly portraits of ourselves, uh, exaggeratedly punching ourselves in the face. Uh, and I, so I guess I had them about five years before one day I decided to use something, uh, use those, those images uh, in this painting. Um, so they were done just hanging around the apartment one day uh, <laughs> and just making fun, silly, stupid pictures. Uh, but while that might end up leading you in the direction of, of doing, doing more, um, but uh, there were several pieces of the series uh, that um, not all necessarily had this exact subject matter, but um, a lot of similar setup and composition and uh, using the, the text, which I occasionally still will revert back to uh, sometimes as um, a compositional or conceptual um, uh, like support structure within a, within a painting. Um, so uh, it's, uh, you know, it's oil and acrylic uh, on canvas. So, you know, um, you want to step inside? Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Adam, uh, can I interrupt a second? Uh, the sound quality is a little shaky. Sound quality was a little bit off there, so I'm not quite sure what's okay. going on, but just to let you know. Okay. Do you get an echo as well? Yeah, a slight echo. Let's see if we can mute his audio and microphone. Is that better? I can hear you better, yeah. Say something, okay. Matt. And again. Say something. Can you hear it better now? Yeah, slightly better. Speak up because it's a, a little, um, the quality is not the greatest. She just said to speak up. Okay, thanks. Okay. So where, you, where would you like to start? Uh, well, I guess. We are kind of going chronologically. Um, this would be kind of the next uh, piece in that uh, order. Um, I had a, so around 2011, 2012, uh, a couple of years after graduation, uh, I had a family member that had been ill and I was making a lot of trips um, back up to where my family is from near Asheville. And uh, I had seen in my drives often um, all these uh, trees that had fallen on the side of the road. Um, and I, I was doing a lot of things about mortality and things of that nature. and they kind of became a, a stand-in for the human form uh, as I was dealing with um, a, a family member that was ill and, and eventually passed away. Um, so those, those trees would just make that drive fairly often and, and it would just strike me often to think about um, how frail we are in our in our human existence, and how easily uh, we can uh, turn ill, um, and and how little time we're really given. Uh, I made th this work uh, along with uh, five other large scale pieces for a uh, solo show that was at CPCC um, called Filigree Fealties. And the kind of then using that tree form along with um, these gradient shapes uh, became kind of a visual language to try to describe a lot of those kind of emotions and, and things that I was feeling and thinking about at that time with the, I guess, a friend of mine calls them shards. Um, and I don't really know exactly how to describe them other than it was to me a sense of, um, our, our movement through life and like how, what our life is and, and, and how time passing and, and these other forces that are, um, uh, impacting us, uh, in our daily life. And then kind of the tree form as, as us as individuals and, and people. Um, they were really fun to make. Um, it was kind of cathartic as well uh, during that time. Um, I, I quite enjoyed them because they, in a way, were more breaking with a lot of the work that I had done previously. Um, which did have, I've never really thought about myself as a figurative painter or an abstract painter because I've always kind of incorporated elements of both, but it was a way to have representation while at the same time incorporating a lot of abstraction um, and, and, and trying to, in a sense, and this is what I kind of have started to try to do and, and all the work since then 
is where I almost try to break painting, quote unquote, like for myself um, and make things that it's like, should I put this here? I'm not really sure, but let's try it and, and see what happens. And I, I because uh, I mean, I don't necessarily want to make work that looks like other people's work. And I don't necessarily want to make quote unquote pretty work either. Um, but I want to make things that I will personally respond to. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was kind of a jumping off point for um, a lot of other things that's that's happened since then. Well, I think, um, I mean, I, I think your description is great. And I, I can I can totally, for me anyway, I can see that um, how you've really nicely captured that idea in this painting. Because I, I, I've always seen those shards, as you call them, as kind of representing the pressure that we are under in life and, and the, the, the tree or the limb kind of representing that organic life that we have and how it can break under that pressure. And I think that you're visually, you've done that really well with the way that you've created this kind of tension in the painting with the color and the shapes and how it's almost at the center, it's kind of breaking that, that limb apart. And, and one thing I do like about your, your painting style as well is that you don't finish every single part of the painting. And you know that could have maybe some representative um, qualities to it, or it could just be more of an aesthetic thing for you. But mm -hmm. for this particular painting, the way that you've left that limb kind of unfinished and unpainted, it almost in my mind kind of represents that part of the life that is yet lived. So it's that part of the tree that hasn't lived when it has been broken apart by this pressure, but it's still existent in some way. Um, and I think in some of your other more, more abstract pieces, the way that you unfinish a piece really allows, or it seems unfinished, really allows for the viewer to, to make a um, kind of an inroad into the process and into your painting. And, and one thing that I've learned about your painting is there are a lot of nuances to your style and your paintings that the more you look at them, the more you see, whether it's a different shade of color or a different brush stroke, um, or even maybe a, a new representative form in there. I mean, I think the more that you look at your pieces, the more you start to see in them. And I think that's really exciting for, for a painting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's always, it's always an experiment. Um, I mean, I think if you get to a point where you know what you're doing every single time, for me, it's, it's not as fun. Yeah. I mean, it's always to try to see like, well, I don't know, I don't, like I, I have enough experience to know what happens when this happens and when I add this color to this color and make this mark, but let's try this other mm -hmm. way. And then, so. Yeah. And then, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say to reference on some of the unfinished parts that, I don't know, it's just something that I've kind of, I've done for a long time um and i'm not really sure why it started but then as i've gone along um it's it's just it leaves like i don't know it's just not having a sense of too polished yeah um also and and just leaving uh maybe an idea of like what else could happen yeah um, and you know some of the some of the parts of your paintings are quote unquote polished, and I think that they're really accented by those parts of the paintings that are less finished or less polished. I mean, I think that it works really well together yeah. and accenting accenting one another, and it's really beautiful visual contrast. That, Thanks. You know, yeah, I, I I do I do hold a big interest in having uh, like a wide variety of. Um, visual information and, and then finish. And I mean, I, uh, one reason why I don't think I could be just a figurative painter is because I, like the surface quality and the, the treatment of the surface as like a flat picture for, uh, plane is also pretty important to me. And that's really a big holdover from like abstraction where it's just like, how did you actually apply this? And what, you know, what is, um, the surface texture or or how did you layer these pigments upon each other and um so like incorporating both of those into um 
a singular picture surface is like has always been a big concern mm -hmm. um, of mm -hmm. mine. Yeah. So I think you balance it really well, though. I really do. Thanks. Yeah. Let's move on. Um, yeah, I was going to say is we can kind of go to like maybe these two, okay. which were kind of, um, you know, there was actually a little bit of a break uh, between some work between that body of work and then these, where maybe I, don't, I was doing I was doing a good amount of commission work. Uh, but then I kind of took some time away from really making a lot of paintings. Uh, you know, sometimes life just happens and you're not able to do as much as you really would like to. Um, but kind of jumping back into these uh, was a point of once again, trying to get to where I was trying to think of how to make things that I wanted to see, but that were different from work I'd done in the past. And like, I, I guess I, I don't want to necessarily go back to it, but just like how to feel like I was breaking painting for myself again. Um, and uh, I had sat with this one for a really long time. And it had been sitting in my studio that, uh, whatever, the, my extra bedroom in my house where I worked out of for a while. And um, and I, did, I would like do a little something to it and then look at it. And I spent probably 90% of my time just like looking at it and I couldn't figure out the next steps to take. And like I said, I was just kind of stuck for a little while. Um, and I found when I get that way, sometimes the best thing is just like kind of put it aside and start on something else. And uh, so I just gave myself a project uh, with this this other smaller painting. And uh, what was nice is neither of these were for anything. And and like I said, I'd spent some time doing commissions for other people or or for. Um, uh, Kind of like more commercial commissions uh and and it was the first time in a while that i was able to just say i'm making something that's purely for myself and i don't have to make anyone happy except for me um and once i kind of started working on this one and um it was the first painting that i had done where uh i decided that i was going to like I went to the store and bought some cans of spray paint because I wanted to just play, not that I even remotely was thinking of trying to be like a street artist or anything like that. That's not really my forte. It's not the direction I was going, but I was trying to figure out, I wanted a new way of working and to, to throw something else into the mix uh, that, not to necessarily inspire me, but maybe more challenge me or to figure out like, this is just a new way of making a mark or this is going to make a different look and how am I gonna to respond to that while working? Um, and so the only thing I had planned out was uh, this picture of my friend and then that's her niece and uh, it's a friend's daughter and um and then so i just started by projecting that on the surface drawing it out and then i just masked it all off and from there i just started making marks with spray paint and then responded to it from there until i got to a point uh where i said i am completely happy with this at this moment and that helped then kind of break free uh, to this painting that I had set with for about two years at that point, unfinished. Um, and to start just making a mark that I wasn't sure what the next step was going to be. Um, I kind of early on, like that very first painting you looked at, uh, from I 
originally studied graphic design and a lot of my work was all built in Photoshop and layers and designed and then just replicated. Um, and I think I got kind of stuck in that working pattern for a while. So working in this capacity uh, was really freeing in a lot of ways uh, to start then with like, yeah, I have a general idea, but let's make a mark and then respond to it um, and see what happens. So it was a lot more exciting in some, in some ways um, and uh, unexpected, but then there can be some failures <laughs> too sure. yeah. uh, if it's not totally all planned out beforehand, uh, which, which is fine. Um, I mean, I think that that's, what we need to be open to right as artists as well yeah, and inviting the other in to see where it goes i mean it's the, one of the consequences is you know that potential you know failure so to speak but maybe it doesn't have the same effect as you're you're thinking but at the same time who knows where that will lead you know who who knows where a mistake like that might lead that you hadn't even considered yeah right? so yeah being open to that i think is important i agree with you yeah, I mean, there's there's the, and I don't know who quoted it, but the happy accidents kind of thing. Oh, yeah, Bob um, Ross said that. Yeah, yeah. Is, is it? Totally. Um, you know, because it makes you never, sense. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. never, you never, like, you know, you might stumble upon a technique that you, you, you know, didn't know existed or didn't know how to work. And then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, there's people who have built whole careers on, like, sure. you know, one, one trademark movement or, or look or technique and, and uh, so I, I think definitely not closing yourself off to just one way of working um, is important uh, to, to learn and, yep. and to try to figure out something. Uh, well something and I think that goes back to your idea of, of breaking painting too. I mean you know it's I've had a lot of abstract painters tell me that you know to, to break the rules you have to know them mm -hmm. right. And so you go to school to like learn the fundamentals, to learn the rules and to give you that, those tools and that toolbox. But then once you're out, you, you kind of have to unlearn some of the things you've learned or, or break it in order to kind of maybe reorganize it in a way that becomes more of, of who you are as an artist. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the spray paint for you, I think is a really great example of, you know, one of those jumping off points where you invited that in without really never have used it before but you were trying to, that was one way of breaking and inviting something new in and breaking your idea mm -hmm. of what you thought painting was in order to maybe allow it to expand yeah. into different areas. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I don't have any of the work really anymore, um, but one thing that I had done uh, in the, my first trip through an undergrad, uh, which was kind of similar, was I started taking uh, like liquid acrylic and doing these like squeegee kind of mm. paintings. Um, and it was, I was, I was just kind of ripping off David Reed. Like, I mean, it wasn't like, but I mean, that's how you kind of learn, right. uh, from the get go is like, it's like, Oh, I like this. How, how did this happen? Like, how did you make this? And, and then, you know, it's, it's all a, a, then a work in progress from there. You, you figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I feel like you have to start somewhere, whether it's, it's trying to emulate people or sitting and doing, I don't know, drawings at the museum from casts of Greek sculpture or, you know, just, just what, whatever it takes uh, to figure it out for yourself. Um, so um, but, let's, let's move over to these. Yeah. So these, these are the two um, most recent works. Yeah, um, this, so this one was kind of also very similar to, uh, um, it's got a kind of lengthy, unwieldy title, but everybody just calls it the Edward Fortigan's painting. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it was similar in that vein where I sat with it for about a couple of years and I wasn't quite sure what was happening with it. Uh, and it's actually one of the only paintings <laughs> that I've done in a long time that's like pretty actually fully finished. Like it's got paint across the whole surface, um, you know, uh, 
but it kind of recently got reinvigorated. I had the idea of these figures, uh, but here lately, I don't know, the idea of really wildly varying um, the look of what's in the painting uh, between having more kind of traditionally rendered surfaces versus uh, spray paint versus brushed gradients versus uh, brought some of the text back into it and then like paint markers and oil paint, acrylic paint, you know, like I just finally got to a point where I was like, I got to do something with this one, even if I'm not happy with it. I just need to finish it and move on because I finally had gotten to the point where I was like, I've sat with this one for too long yeah. looking at it. And I mean, sometimes a painting will just get abandoned totally and never come back to it. But I, I really wanted to finish this one. So I just I just ran with it and said, we're going to we're going to finish it. And uh, although I'm not I'm not going to say it's 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. There might be some changes that end up coming back with this one. Um, but it's also fun to, I think, fun to show stuff that you're also not 100% happy with it. Yeah. At least maybe not always in a show, but to show it to as many people as you can. Because feedback's important. Sure. And, and also it's great to hear what other people will say because, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had a piece that I'm not, but it's like, eh, I'm like, eh, I don't know. I'm on the fence. I don't know how to feel about it. And other people are like, I love this one. <laughs> or, or, or vice, you know, the flip side where you're like, so happy with this piece and people are like nah dude i don't i don't really care for this one and you're like what are we looking at the same painting you know so um it's just uh you know i i just wanted to definitely have it out as as uh to show it in the context of all the other work yeah. um which was also really i mean a great like uh, chance about this was to kind of see everything all sure. together, which mm -hmm. sometimes is hard to do. Um, when it gives you a chance to see this piece that you're still on the fence about, you know, alongside other pieces and also, you know, on the wall with some light, you can get some distance on it. Mm -hmm. So maybe that will kind of help, help you decide what, what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Next. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then this is probably, I mean, I guess really uh other than some of these other little small works is the most recent uh piece that i've done um and i mean i i'm guessing that it's kind of a partial culmination of of the ways of working uh that i've kind of messed with there was like some spray paint application before I started doing anything else really. Um, just to sometimes, I mean, sometimes it even helps to just from, from a, I learned when I was trying to paint purely abstractly that just staring at a blank white canvas sometimes is one of the worst things that you can possibly do because you don't want to mess it up <laughs> getting right. started. So yeah. sometimes just, putting something down is like the best way to just make something happen and so you know i just did some marks here and then put a piece of tape there and sprayed over it peel it off put another one down you know um and then went in and cut areas out of the imagery that i felt i didn't want to use suppose this uh, started painting and then decided I wanted to layer in a gradient here. So then masked everything off and sprayed that in and um, had taken the image and still played with it in Photoshop, cut more hands into it. Um, and then also just kind of, once again, trying to work with the idea of more traditionally rendered surfaces. 
um, you know, just purely abstraction color. Um, you know, did a, another kind of gradient there, and then just some loose brushwork there, but more, you know, traditionally rendered areas, and and then brushworky, uh, more kind of unfinished areas. I really um, like. I want to point this this part here. So you do have this nice little detail of you know the jacket, and you have this the kind of crisp line that that starts and ends the two different areas. But then here you have the jacket being kind of torn and frayed. Mm -hmm. and it's it's almost kind of penetrating, you know that that distinct separation of those two parts of the painting. I mean, I, I think that in a very physical way, I think that's a really beautiful part of that painting. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's it was fun to play with just all the variation of um, imagery, texture, color, shapes. Um, yeah, th this was a really fun painting to do. And I, I really enjoyed painting it. And like, I'm, I'm really happy with the outcome. Um, uh, so Let, let's go back to our computers and we'll answer some questions. Okay. From So again, thank you all for sending so many great questions. Um, you never cease to amaze me with. Okay, so um, we do have a nice diverse pool of questions. Some of them relate to your work. Um, some relate to your kind of whole path after school. And, um, you know, maybe we'll start with, with some of those. Um, so Amber asked, uh, can you talk about the transition from your BFA into a working artist? Um, how seamless an experience was it? Uh, what things did you do before graduation that helped you set up that transition? That's a big question. Yeah. Um... So I didn't have a seamless <laughs> transition at all. Uh, I was a student from uh, till about 2000, never finished my uh, BFA. Uh, I had to leave school for a number of years uh, and then came back in 2008, 2009, uh, finished my undergrad then. Uh, during that time off, I was continuously making work um, I lived in Southern California for a couple of years uh, in Los Angeles, which was great because I was going to, to galleries and, and exhibitions and stuff all the time, met a bunch of people. Um, I, you know, uh, was able to see great museums, LACMA, uh, MOCA, um, going to like the Gagosian galleries, seeing all these really famous blue chip shows, as well as, you know, little tiny, dirty punk rock clubs and shows and stuff. Um, honestly, that was one of the, that being out there was one of the biggest parts of my like development, I think, as an artist. Um, and then when I came back to finish my undergrad, I was about 30 years old at that time. Um, and I think that having uh, that time away uh, from a school environment really invigorate, like reinvigorated me to uh, when I came back. Um, and then through school, um, I got a better idea of kind of the direction I wanted to head uh, afterwards. Um, when I finished, uh, undergrad, uh, the next thing I did kind of other than making a little bit of work for myself, I mean, I think like everybody, I kind of was like, what next? Um, and I wasn't sure whether I was like, do I try to get a gallery or do I try to um, 
Do I just keep making work? Do I try to do a more of a commercial vein? Like what was gonna happen with that? Uh, the next step I did was I actually uh, applied to uh, the McCall Center uh, and was awarded like a summer, uh, a summer visiting artist or what, you know, whatever you wanna call it, affiliate artist, uh, that program which was pretty amazing because uh, number one, it made me feel like a somewhat of a sense of like validation, like, oh, okay, like, I guess I need to make some work now and, and you know, and kind of lit a fire under me to be like, I can't just waste this time. Um, and that was really great because it led to a couple of things that I, I would never have gotten otherwise. Uh, I was involved in a show uh, I guess I think it was five person show, uh, at the, uh, North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, uh, that was up for about 10 months. Um, and I mean, that was a direct, um, it was directly because I know I was, uh, at the McCall Center at that time. And that's probably the only way that, uh, that curator, uh, found me. Um, and, and since then, I guess, uh, I don't know. I, there's. I don't think there's any one good <laughs> uh, path for anyone. Um, I don't know. Am I rambling? <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, I, I think you know the McCall being the starting point for that. I think is important, and you know that that led into your involvement with um, you know Goodyear Arts. Yeah. Where you're a collective artist, and you had a residency there as well. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, from from those two, you were you had a piece recently um, in the, the Coin in the South show at the Mint Museum, which was. was oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, that, like that was that was awesome, too. I mean, it feels great to all to, you know, be involved with the, all these uh, awesome uh, programs. Um, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people kind of feel lost once they're done with their, their undergrad experience. Um, and unfortunately, like, and I think this has always been the case and, and probably will continue to be, unfortunately, is a lot of people kind of quit making uh, when they get done with school um, because they kind of feel lost and they're not sure what the next step is. And I think that at least for me personally, I've realized that a lot of the opportunities that exist out there uh, are available to me because I didn't stop working. Um, you know, as long as you're continually making things and doing things, um, you know, it might not seem like anyone's paying attention when you get right out of school. Uh, but if you continually show up and, and keep making things and act like you're interested and make friends with people and talk to people about things and, and go to shows and, you know, um, people tend to notice and you'll, you'll, you'll find that the, I think that the more proactive you are, maybe the more, uh, possibilities and, um, you know, positive outcomes might find you, you know, the, the more you're around, the more you make yourself available. Um, you know, and, and I think that's across all the arts. I don't think it's necessarily just painting. I mean, I think it's, you know, performative arts, sculpture, design, you know, what, what have you, as long as you're kind of a, a member of a community, then you'll, you'll find more opportunities present themselves. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it is discouraging for some people once, you know, they're, they're out of that college environment. I mean, you know, first of all, you, you may not have the resources that you've had as a student. Mm -hmm. um, but, but second of all, you know, you've kind of lost your, your herd, so to speak, right? I mean, you, you know, that, that group that you've, you've kind of, um, you've grown up with in a way, and you've learned these things with, I mean, they become your kind of constructive group um and you know you feed off each other's energies and ideas and you know after college everybody kind of 
splits and um, or at least in a lot of cases and so you're kind of left also alone but you know i do think that there are opportunities certainly in charlotte that you can kind of you know network and keep that kind of group around you and, and create you know just expand it and enlarge it and you know allow that to work for you too in terms of you know exhibition opportunities or residency opportunities or you know meeting other people who might lead to um to, to new friends and new contacts and that's that's a really great way to to grow too yeah i mean there's there's definitely a i think a cumulative support structure that will happen um over time and um you, you and and you never know where your your support's going to come from um you know i have i have friends that I made in my original initial undergrad uh, here a long time ago that have now uh, included me in a show, you know, out in, in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, you know, um, and, and those kind of things like, you know, you, you help each other out and, and the people that you respect and admire, you know, you want them to be involved and um, and it can, it can be, you know, it can be frustrating or kind of demoralizing sometimes when, um, I know I, I felt it because a lot of my friends from my uh, initial undergrad experience have all left and moved and, you know, they're all around the country now. And so sometimes when you don't feel, um, like anyone's around anymore, it's, it's hard sometimes, um, you know, to, to. And, and life just happens too. I mean, sometimes, you know, you got, everybody's got to worry about how they're going to pay the bills and, and keep a roof over their head. And sometimes when you feel like you're working all the time, like, how am I going to get in the studio or how am I going to be able to make this happen? And it can be, it can be hard. And I mean, I, I understand why people um, sometimes quit and, and aren't able to keep stuff going. And, and, you know, it's I mean, 12 o'clock. It's, it happens like that sometimes. Um, it's, it's difficult. I, I understand. <laughs> You know, we have some questions about um, about your work and, and what's inspired some of your work. And, and you know, we talked a, a little bit about your work being very process oriented. I mean, I, I think that your your need to create and, and remain experimental with your process uh, really is inspiring to your work and is, it really drives your work. In fact, the, the title of the show of Constant Concern is really about your concern about keeping that studio process engaged and open and experimental. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if there are things kind of beyond that that inspire certain series or certain works. I mean, more subjective things in, um, you know, uh, whether it be a philosophy or psychology or, or something that you, you think about when creating these works that maybe kind of reach beyond just the process part of creating it? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure because I, I don't, I'm kind of, I'm kind of always uh, excited to learn where these ideas come from too, because uh, a lot of times they just kind of pop into my head and then I want than to see that through to fruition. Um, I'm not sure if I have uh, like a standard set of guidelines or um, a philosophy or anything that really I follow other than um, I only know the way that works for me to work um, and, and it works for me um until it doesn't and then i try to adjust and change it um and but what i find works for me is that uh i had a problem when i was an undergrad about with like art or art block or or creative block and and i found because i sometimes i didn't know what imagery i wanted to to peruse or or or, or to to put out into the world and so kind of the way I got around that, the kind of loophole, working loophole was I started to um, write and come up with all my titles before I ever did anything else. 
So like my sketchbook would be a lot of just phrasing and phrases and writing. Um, and then I found that that then really dictated and um, made the imagery came from that. Um, and so from then on, that's been a big driving force in the work that I've made. Um, so I guess it's, it, that's kind of the basis in the beginnings. And then after that, it's um, just trying to make, make work that I'm happy with um, that hopefully doesn't look too much like anybody else's. Like hopefully it's, it's uh, recognizable as, as mine, uh, I think is important to me. Um, and, and then just uh, to, to just be experimental um, and, and to actually have a little bit of fun with it too. Um, I, I, I mean, some of, some of the work is about serious subjects, uh, but I try to make sure that, that I've kept it fun for myself. And I think that if you kind of look, look at it in a certain light, um, a lot of times it can be seen as uh, um, having a little bit of sense of fun and, and levity to it as, as well. Um, so yeah, I don't think I really have like a specific philosophy, but um, I'm just happy that I get to do this and anybody, and sometimes people give me a little bit of money for it and people are interested. Like, cause I mean, you know, like, you know, the worst is, is if no one cares, you know, and then like, you know, I mean, but I don't know if I, I'd probably still do it anyway, but, uh, just cause I, I do enjoy it, but it's, it's, um, it's nice to, to have a little bit of back and forth dialogue with people about it too. So I guess that's what keeps me going. We've also had a, a, a few questions about your, um, your print work, which we really didn't talk about when we were going around the gallery. I mean, we do have about five of your prints in the show, or well, just one of the prints, I guess the smaller mm -hmm. pieces are, are still paintings. Um, but could you talk a little bit about your, your print process? And I mean, do you, do you have your own press or, you know, how do you create these, these prints? Uh, I, I don't have a, a press and I mean, I guess I could, if, if I made a few phone calls, I could probably have access to some, you know, uh, try to get in touch with people, but, um, it's something that I only got to explore like a little bit, uh, in school. Um, I would have liked to have done more printmaking, uh, just because of the possibilities. Um, I, I also am really, uh, interested in, um, I do a lot of large scale work, uh, which is very time consuming. Um, but, uh, in the last couple of years, I've gotten really involved or, or wanted to make smaller works because I, I wanna make stuff that's also affordable for people um, because I know not everybody has the space or the money to invest in like a giant painting. Um, and that's another reason why printmaking is really kind of like, I would, I would like to get more involved with it. Um, one, one thing that uh, I got involved with though a, a lot of years ago was, uh, this thing called lacquer thinner transfers. Um, and basically uh, a buddy of mine kind of taught me about it. And uh, you can basically using like um, a laser jet printer or just even print out, you know, magazine tear sheets or, or anything like that, um, do transfers right onto uh, paper using some kind of uh, lacquer thinner works really great, but be careful, it's really toxic. So you wanna do it in a well ventilated area with gloves and such, but um, you just kind of, you can brush it on the back and, and rub it right onto the paper and it transfers down. Uh, that's been a really big process. I've done a lot of prints uh, using that and uh, it's been able to um, 
I can do stuff on the computer and do designs cut out. And so it's almost like a collage process and then put it down, but it, it gives this wonderful sense of, um, uh, even though it's not texture, a uh, wonderful sense of, um, it only transfers where you actually rub it. So it can give um, a lot of stuff. Yeah, you can see where the actual rub lines are in the bottom of that figure. And um, so that's got kind of several different things going on. It's got some mono printing and, and some charcoal and then some pencil and then, um, that's the upper part of California that I kind of pieced together in a couple of ways and flipped around. And um, so it's kind of more design based kind of print, but it's very fun to do. Um, we did have a question about this print. One student was wondering why, I mean, it seems so minimal. Why did you decide to use color? Uh, why, why did I decide to use color? Or, yeah. uh, um, you know, sometimes there's like big answers for things and then sometimes there's not. And <laughs> sometimes you just decide uh, that it needs something and what is it gonna be or it, it needs something compositionally. Um, I actually made this print uh, in the printmaking room here at UNCC. Um, and those were a couple of colors that were available. <laughs> um, I, I don't really remember why I picked those. Um, it, those were the black and the, the kind of yellow ochre and the, the blue um, were those were actually just a mono print on a plastic sheet um and uh kind of rolled out um and went through um you know so maybe that was almost like a proto uh spray paint because i think i put those down first and then kind of layered everything else around it um you know sometimes you just make play with a composition and you're happy with the results or happy with the outcome. Um, um, I know I had uh, already picked that figure um, and I picked that, I had done the, the design with the layout um, of the top of the state outline of California, but I didn't exactly know how it was gonna turn out quite yet, so. So I think we have time for one more question. And um, it's a question that it always seems to pop up um, but what about um, this past year and, you know, having to really pivot as, as everybody has done um, with the pandemic, how has it affected, you know, your studio practice, your, your access to the studio, um, or even maybe your perspective on your work, or has it found its way into the subject matter of some of your work? How, how has the, the past year really affected you as an artist? Uh, I mean, I think that as an artist, uh, I think most artists are probably a little more like empathetic than some of the general population probably. Um, you know, it's been, the past year has been a little depressing in a, in a lot of ways. Like, you know, you're a little scary, like we're not sure what's happening you know, especially uh, about a year ago when it was the first stages and uh, for about the first couple of months, um, wasn't allowed in, in my studio. Um, so I, I had some materials at home, did, you know, was kind of working on some things at home, but wasn't really, really feeling it, you know, um, didn't do a lot of work. Uh, I know some people were all, I'm going to, use this time to the best of my ability and uh but i personally wasn't feeling it the first few months and uh i did i worked on my house a bunch i i walked a bunch um just tried to spend a lot of time outdoors soak up the sun you know if i wasn't 
going to be working or being able to be in the studio. I was just trying to do stuff um, that felt good for my mental and physical health. Um, you know, but then after a few months, it kind of started to feel uh, like I needed to start getting some work done. And um, so I kind of started processing some more ideas and, and um, I, I just think that um, it's been a weird time for everybody and you got to do what, uh, no one can tell you whether what you did or what you're doing now is right or wrong. Um, you have to do what makes you feel happy and what you're satisfied with doing. Um, and if, if you're not feeling satisfied with what you're doing, make a change to to move towards that, um, I, I don't know. It, it was, uh, you know, I, I was kind of felt lost and confused at first. And, and um, but once we finally got back to being able to use our studio spaces, masked of course and stuff, um, I found that I did kind of hit it full force um, and have been trying to, uh, to, to get back into uh, making as much stuff as possible and, and not trying to to waste time. Took, took a little while, but you know, um, but I, I think that's okay. Some, sometimes you gotta take a break from, from stuff, if, especially if, if you're not, if you don't feel good. I mean, you have to treat it like work and get in and make the work happen. But, you know, sometimes, yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of heavy, heavy stuff <laughs> over the last year, you know? Yeah. And I mean, good, good for you that, I mean, you know, not having access to your studio, you didn't allow that to, you know, completely stop what you wanted to do as an artist. I mean, you know, it would be so easy to kind of get out of the rhythm and get out of the flow. Um, and it, you know, it's always harder to, to start, you know, and start back again it might be even harder. Um, yeah. but you know, it's great that you use that time, um, as, as kind of a resting period. And then after you were able to get back in your studio, you really just went in and all of that creative energy that had been, um, been pinned up in those, those first few months. I mean, you just, you, you were able to, to let it out and it just picked right back up, um, yeah. if not even stronger than where you were before, before it all kind of went crazy. Yeah. So that's, well, that's great. I think, I think a lot of it is, is momentum, you know? Sure. Um, and I think when you get out of it, yeah, it, is, it can be hard to, to pick back up, but I think, you know, once, I, at least for me, I mean, once I start making stuff, I, I want to be in the studio more, um, you know, and, and more and more. So, the, you know, it's just builds upon itself. Um, so getting out of the habit is then kind of the same way sometimes <laughs> so well it's it's been great to work with you and um, i mean i'm so glad that, that we were able to work with you on this exhibition and, and have your pieces on the wall here in a row and i mean once things do start to open up i mean your studio is at goodyear so um i mean you're you're there a lot you know yeah. working and i know that goodyear I mean, it generally has kind of an open door policy that if the, the artists are there working, I mean, they, they encourage and invite people to come in and interact with the artists. And so, you know, once things are, are back on that level again, I mean, if you know, students can come down there and meet you and kind of see your studio space and maybe kind of continue a conversation with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we always are having shows um, now kind of started back this past month um actually last month with uh because we started doing residencies again and um uh most friday nights open hours six to nine two to come by and see the shows so um, it's a it's a wonderful uh resource and um you know i'm very glad to be involved with it and uh you know and you know i'm glad uh glad you invited me to be a part of this uh show yeah Absolutely. It's been great. And, and it, it's up for another couple of weeks. It closes April 21st and um, the galleries here are open Monday through Friday, 10 to four. So anybody who wants to come by and see the shows, please 
uh, feel free to do that and follow us on Instagram, UNCC Galleries. You can kind of keep up with everything that we're doing. Um, and also follow uh, follow Matt on Instagram. He's there and posts pretty regularly. So it's a great way to, to keep in touch with everybody and see what we're all doing. Yeah, Nathaniel Lancaster Art. And with that, I think we're, we'll conclude this this week's session. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Nat. Thanks, y'all. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you.